The desert is what dreams are made of. Where you can listen to America's most Catholic podcast, The Pod People. <laughs> I'm Matisse Fenross, and I'm smoking on that Spanish gas. I'm Blasphemy Nightmare, <laughs> a.k.a. Ben Sheets. <laughs> and we have such sights to show you. Or in this case, such shites to show you. <laughs> the real shites. Um, hi, I'm Cleveland Mosier, and tonight I just want you to go to sleepy, little baby. <laughs> well, you can't go to sleepy just yet, little baby, so you gotta listen to the podcast first. Welcome to our 2023 mid-year catch-up. Yes. Uh, T.C., you're in the lead so far. Well, yes. So you picked two movies for us. But I'm not that far behind you, I motherfucker. Did. I'm coming for you. Uh, yeah, we'll see about I'm that. Coming for we'll you. see about that. But yes, as the as the current front runner, I got to curate our show this evening. Uh, picked a couple of uh, 2023 films that we uh, that we've not talked about yet. And uh, as I mentioned at the end of last week's episode, I had a little bit of a theme in mind when choosing these films. Um, so we're, we're calling this episode Cleveland's Despair, Cleveland's Delight. Because <laughs> uh, I, I, I picked a film that I, uh, I knew would cause Cleveland great despair, yes. but also picked a film that would give him great delight. Thank you. Yes. And... and uh, uh... I mean, honestly, for me, it was Ben's Delight, Ben's Delight. Yeah, you won. To differing degrees. It's it's, it's so silly to um, me that you, you lost the contest, but really, you did come out the best in the scenario. You really, hey, you really did mean, win. Both I mean, yeah, I, I liked pretty, both. Pretty good. I liked so. both movies too, so I'm. I feel like I'm also walking out of here a winner. Good. Yeah. Um, That's good enough for me. You know, like for win, for the, win, 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 or lose, win. For the, the most part, That's a good, I, yeah. For the most part, I don't think uh, either of the films that we're talking about this evening are without fault. Yes. No. Uh, yeah. um, certainly not. Um, we're going to, we're going to start, we're going to start with, um, with Cleve's despair. Uh, we're going to get the argument out of the way first yeah. and then uh, end on a more lighthearted note. So we're going to start with uh, <laughs> the outwaters. Yeah, we are. Which is uh, an experimental found footage horror film written and directed by Robbie Banfitch. And starring. And starring Robbie Banfitch as well, yes, that's correct. Um, this movie uh, got a limited theatrical release around the same time as Skin and Marink. A lot mm -hmm. of people were talking about them in the same breath. Um, yeah, I think we'll it do... got a lot of buzz online. I think, yeah, Skin and Marink uh, blew up more than The Outwaters did for sure. Um, but I definitely okay. uh, heard them mentioned alongside one another. And uh, we will inevitably make some Skin and Marink comparisons. I'm going to give uh, sort of a broad overview of the film just to introduce people to it who might not have seen it, and then I will let you off the leash, I promise. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm, and I'm, we'll, I'm, and I'm not like a... Well, I mean, okay, maybe I'm a little like a pit bull right now. And, uh, <laughs> oh, my God. Let me get him. And I'll let <laughs> you go, yeah. Um, no, no, by all means. Take so, it. yeah. Uh, found footage horror film about four friends who go out into the desert to shoot the worst music video ever made. <laughs> um, and it, it sort of then devolves into a sort of uh, surrealistic nightmare. Uh, a general bad time. A general a general bad time. Yeah. yeah. Um, for the, the movies, I, I feel like pretty cleanly divided in two. The first hour uh, is sort of your typical setting up of characters and setting... Uh, location, all of that stuff, and then uh, at a certain point a flip is switched and the movie um, sort of loses narrative structure and becomes more just sort of like... A complete schizo hole <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, and and we'll, we'll get into that. I will admit I did not love the first half of this movie, uh, but for me... Yeah, it sucks. But but for me, the second half uh, more than makes up for it in just about every way. Um, that sort of general uh, general blanket covering of the film, uh, Cleveland. I no, you've no, seen no, this. No, no. Honestly, I, you, you guys keep talking about what you like about the movie. I'll come in and shit on your parade after. But I'd rather just let you guys talk. What, about What, you what like I about really it. respect about this movie is the first half really sets it up to be like a sort of bland. Blair Witch wannabe kind of clone, and then in the second half it just goes off the fucking rails to become something stranger and more abstract, and something like 
very liminal in a lot of ways. It plays with, you know, the senses of atmosphere and kind of being stuck in these foreign locations. It gets very cosmic, too. Yes. Um, I, I really respect it for that, you know, and I, I totally agree. It takes a little too long to get going. Yeah. And it doesn't help that the the characters are kind of bland and not great. Yeah. And I think sort of intentionally so. But, you know, we probably could have gotten to things a bit faster. Yeah, I would say but... that the, the, in terms of, like, the characters, they sort of run a narrow gamut from, like, best case scenario, um, kind of annoying and frustrating to worst case scenario being like totally insufferable. Yeah. yeah. Um they, and, they do feel like real characters. I yeah, will say. sure. I mean they feel like people I have met in real life. Yes. Um I <laughs> I I know that while we were watching it we were clowning on them a lot because they are kind of uh insufferable like California uh, music hippie. Oh, they're co- from New Jersey. That's well, the, the, one of one of them is yeah, yeah, one yeah. of the, the three of them. The two brothers and the the singer live in California, and then they bring their friend out from Jersey to help yeah. them. Uh, but yeah, they're they're very they're very like <sighs> Coachella, Burning Man ass sort of like hippie white people. Yeah, um, it's the the Bo Burnham white woman on the instagram bit like yeah for for an hour and it's so i was thinking about it right and like okay so i i earnestly can't tell and frankly i almost don't care but like <laughs> care to tell but uh i can't tell if it's self-aware or not like if if these people are like hey we're just kind of showing ourselves in this movie you know to create realism or if they're trying to like do a bit where it's like hey look at these silly hippies right but, and, and the problem is that they don't, if it is self-aware, what's the joke? It's just an hour of, of these, these people just being annoying. Yeah. And it's not played for, there's no bit, like there's nothing funny that comes out of that. I mean, there's nothing like entertaining that comes out of that. It's boring. I don't they, think it's several... meant to be comedic. I think it's meant to, again emphasize how drastic the left turn the movie takes is because it does feel by very being boring not by being boring but by being kind of generally you know kind of insufferable characters and not being super wink wink nudge nudge about it i mean but doing that for an hour is is like not good yeah like I... like, like, like that's like that's that's who is that for at that point, right? Like you don't at that point you don't care about your viewer. I'm I'm with you on that to to maybe a, a slightly less vitriolic degree. Sure. Like I I absolutely think this movie's two hours long. There's no reason for it to be to be that long. No. Similar complaint that I had with Skin and Uh I you know I, mm-hmm. I I've kind of come around on Skin and some. I think. I think Skinnamarink, the pace is a little bit more intentional and to sort of like lull you into this sort of like hypnosis of the style and the repetition of of like these cycles in the house and so on and so forth. Like it's not always the most engaging, but it feels more intentional. Whereas this, it's like, yeah, I I think that the characters are are intentionally kind of annoying, like the way they are. I do feel like it's trying to um say something about these kind of like faux like soulful Coachella ass motherfuckers going out into the desert the problem is is like yeah an hour to spend with them with very little point of relation or somebody to like actually like a care about or appreciate okay. it's too long i think i think you could cut out like i think you could cut out like 30 minutes of the first yeah. hour well, you i wouldn't could. i wouldn't like, like, touch pacing, the back half like like the pacing in the first half that's what's so like boring about it to me is that there are several repeated sequences that say nothing right like we get like a sequence where she's singing and then we get another one where she's singing we get another sequence where they're driving in a car that's back to back by another sequence where they're driving in a car like it doesn't show a good sense of filmmaking it doesn't See, show like they understand how to pace a movie 
Uh-huh. It's boring. And it's like a lot of like hipstery shots of like, oh, they're running their fingers through like a plastic chandelier. Or like, ooh, she's like they're they're filming the trees in the car, but it's upside down like midsummer, but not because it's not so, well shot. See, so one like, thing we should we should emphasize before we get too far in is the framing device of this film. So the movie starts out with this nine one one call mm-hmm. of these kind of frantic uh, pitched up voices just screaming for mommy and you know begging for their lives mm-hmm. and it's it's pretty frightening honestly yeah um, uh, as it of... sort of shows like the pictures of these people it's like you know these four people went missing in 2017 last scene. you know last seen 2017 yeah. found the, their um, camera and yeah. they found their camera and three sd cards mm-hmm. and this is the unabridged copy of all the footage of the three sd cards yeah and and i i know where you're going with this and i think that it is designed to make it feel more authentic that this is like all of the unedited footage that they're pulling off these cards because these type of people in real life who do film everything yeah a lot of it is just like boring nothing shots of you know them fucking holding their hand out the window or like wading in some water and stuff and and it's supposed to feel like like yeah this is something that was found it's supposed to be like found footage like the Blair Witch you know yeah Um, and I mean on a structural level I I understand what they're going at yes like three cards one card is everything's normal we get to know the characters we hang with the characters essentially Mm -hmm. card two things start being a little weird and strange and something's off and you can tell and card three what way does that happen in card two uh, in card two, well, not to jump ahead too far, but we get, uh, it's the first night that they're there and loud bangs start happening. I don't think that happens well, until card three. three. I think, but I do, there does start to be some weird stuff creeping in with card two with like particularly with like audio distortions like at the end of a lot of clips like the audio will get like really weird yeah and and it it, to me it it feels like diegetic there are certain times where it's like choir music played over it and like suddenly it gets warped by the end or um no that's like early that's on just in the car radio. that's just them listening to music in the car or, but like well there's that but then there's a, there's another time later on where it is like music played over the top of it like like when he's like out in the water no uh, that there's there's no music over that there is there is some point where like like it plays like music over the top of it like no. and it no and it's um like like when they're in the car at least it's but, yeah like, it's, well, they're, okay, so yeah. they're let's, in let's the car the for car. A, they're in the car for a long time let's, let's <laughs> take the car one because it happens several times like during like the first or second car where like a, the sequence is going normally and right before the sequence ends the music gets pitched up and bent for the the sake of of being like scary like like it's like Wah! and then it cuts to like another normal thing happening and like it does this several times like yeah, in the first in the first I part. mean it establishes a it establishes a pattern of the audio warping at the end of these clips yeah but like why why is it like it's still all on the same card, so, like, why is it happening, like, exactly where you'd want a dramatic beat? I mean, it's, like, it's happening more the closer they get just, to the It feels the, so, the like, desert. yeah. Like, like, artificial. It's, like, uh, it, it feels like, um, it, it doesn't feel like found footage to me. Like, it, it feels, it feels like, uh, precise editing. Like, it, it doesn't, I don't know, it, it doesn't feel like part of the medium. It's, it's just something you see, like, all the time in, like, regular horror movies. <laughs> Kind of, but I mean, especially once you get into the second half on the third card and, like, shit gets really crazy and we see how audio is, like, continually distorted by whatever is happening here. Like, Ben's right. Like, these, in in the first couple of cards, like, these things start to happen more and more, like, the closer they're getting to where they're going, like, as they get out more into the desert. So, like, yeah, it might, I, I don't disagree that it feels a little strange 
early on, but by the end, it feels motivated. It's like whatever is happening at this place is like starting to affect them more and more, starting to affect things more and more as they get closer to like the locus of it. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I, I think that I, yeah, that's all, road, it's, it's I think that's all like, fairly justified early on in the movie where like nothing is really happening. Like, and it, it just, it feels like a cheap way to like make, keep your attention. Like, it's just like, you know, like, ooh, put a cue, put a sting, put a musical stinger here, and then, like, it's, like, I, on to the I, next thing, they, and, like, I don't... I really don't think they do that, like, hardly at all until they start getting out into the desert. Like, at least once they're out in the car. Like, I, I it's... In all this stuff before that, they don't put in, like, scary music. It's yeah. just, like, in every and scene, the the people are listening to music, so there's always music going in the background. I do want to say the white girl's song. Oh, my God. Is dude. one of the worst. Songs. What genre oh. is that? Because it's, like, lullabies, but it's nursery auto-tuned rhymes. with, like, bad. electro-folk Wait, underneath. Well, see, that's the thing, is, like, it's it's kind of, like, it's... We're, we're laughing at it because it's bad, but, like, it goes on. It does. Like, it goes on like, for way too it, long. It starts with, like, her doing one of these songs where she's like, you know, go to sleepy little baby. Mama will get you all the pretty horses. It, I and mean, it's listen, literally... Like, she, she records, like, like the whole first, like, chorus and verse, and then we hear it back again in, like, shitty auto-tune. And then, like, we she does another song... And and then she does like the the one where she's like clacking the rocks together and she's singing another lullaby about like fucking horses and shit. His and bitch only like, no lullabies. One of the most insufferable because she uh, she lost her mom recently and yeah. so her trauma has become her whole personality. Yeah, her mom used to sing the children's lullaby, all the pretty little horses, to her as a child. Yeah. So now she's trying to become a singer or whatever. So she does like a soulful uh, electro folk uh, cover of this children's lullaby. There's like so much they... good electro folk, and yeah. like this is nah, this no, not <laughs> not not in not, not in like this that. not this, this type of, not these type of people. This this like... this is the type of this is the type of the girl who. The, the kind of like California white blonde hippie who will like get really emotional when you put the chain smokers on, you know? Like, <laughs> and like, and, uh, this song just, it's so, it just speaks to my soul. That's you funny know, yeah. Like, what you're saying here and like what you're doing is funny. The movie. I mean, I'm making a joke out of it. Yeah, you're, and... you're making it entertaining. And like I, I do, I do think that there is. I, I, I think that there's definitely some self awareness here in like the type of characters these are. But like Ben, you mentioned that like the first card is like just us hanging out with them, which is totally true and is a way to introduce the characters. I guess the problem is that I don't want to hang out with any no, of these people. No, no. I've hung out with enough of these type of people. Going to a going to fucking film school. Yes. Like I don't I don't want to hang out with I, these characters. I will say the one thing. The one thing about the first card is, I I do think it's too long. However, I think they do do some good setup. That it establishes is good context for later events in the movie. It establish yeah. I think the first half does very deliberately establish some. We'll call them themes. Uh, and visual motifs that do sort of inform the less structured, uh, more surreal chaos of the second half. It's sort that of I recontextualized. Think, right? Yeah, like, or that at least they, that at least gives you some kind something to kind of hold on to as you're like pulled yeah. through what is essentially just like a like an expressionistic nightmare. Yeah, one of one of the best examples is. Early in the first card, Robbie goes to visit his mom. Uh, Her acting is dog shit, though. Yeah, it's fine. Whatever. It's, no, like when she opens the door and like, like they go to like, and she's all like, she fakes being surprised by them. Like, okay, it's... but she's on camera for like less than a minute. I don't. It's a I bad don't fucking minute, care. Right. Okay. Like, yeah, I'm just yeah, saying, her, her I acting mean, is like pretty fucking rough. I think that's somewhat intentional as well. If you point a camera in front of someone they're gonna act strangely no it is felt like she hammed it up with the camera people do have sort of a natural inclination to exaggerate their behavior while on camera and it yeah. can seem awkward and weird it's yeah. i mean and again it's like less than a minute long like i don't 
I don't care. I care more about the rest of these fucking annoying characters that I have to spend a lot of time with. But yes, motherhood so is bad. is like a big central theme in this movie. Yeah. Um, I can't say I, I really know what the movie's trying to say about motherhood, but... It certainly is saying something. You know, there's the relationship with their mother. The older brother seems kind of estranged from the mom. You've got your our, our singer who is like, you know, recently lost her mom. And they keep telling her, like, oh, you sound just like your mom. You look just like your mom. She's like, I'm going to cry. I'm going to cry, you guys. Um, <laughs> so, like, they're, they're doing a lot to set up, uh, you know, the idea of maternal connection yeah. in some regard um, and they set up vague reads for the kind of abstractness and ambiguity of the later parts of the movie by talking about how they have a conversation where they they talk about how if you get hit in the head it can like release past drugs that you take oh the oh yeah she's she's going like yeah all the drugs you take collect in your spine so if you uh Get if you crack your back, you can release all of those drugs yeah. or whatever. Or get which, hit in the yeah. head. Um, yeah, that and uh, they also uh, introduce kind of the sensitivity to the heat because Robbie's apartment doesn't have air conditioning, so they're you know huddled around the the freezer at one point. Oh yeah, and uh, you know. Could read it's, some of that. It's I, hot in the desert. Yeah, <laughs> it, it it sure is. Um, I I do like the desert as a setting for this type of movie. Yeah. I think the desert is an underutilized setting in a lot of horror. Um, well, yeah, because it's so isolated and it's isolated from so much. Yeah, it's it's alien. Yeah, the desert like being out way out in the desert is like being on another planet. It's hostile, you know. And and one of the the, the kind of imp- impressive things about this movie is you know you don't really see daytime horror all that much yeah and i feel well this this is a fair amount of both it it has a fair amount of both but it does have a fair amount of bright Mm -hmm. scenes with you know very confusing horrifying things going on yeah well i think we should start talking about the second half because that's where most of my thoughts and feelings lie and where the movie really succeeds for me and we've got a whole nother movie to talk about after that so yeah um we get into we get into the third card and their first night they're awoken by um really loud thunder but it also kind of sounds like explosions um so one thing i want to point out because uh, Cleve asked me during the movie to check the time when this started happening. The first, like, booms were at, like, 40 minutes in the movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Which... So, so it was, like, our, our time was wasted on these, like, fucking hipsters without any laughs or anything, like, 40 minutes into the film. That's what I was looking for. It's like, okay, yeah, how long has this movie wasted our time? It is a long, it is a long a time to movie. wait, yeah. But the second two-thirds even you know yeah i i would say that like you know after their after that first night you know they kind of like brush it off and have like a whole other day where like there's some weird things but like it's still kind of more toned down like the the really crazy shit starts there's, like pretty much an there's hour a sense in. of something being off and yeah a sense of dread like they find uh holes in some of the the rock walls yeah i like when he puts the weird sounds coming out of them like when he puts the stuffs the microphone down in one of those holes and it's just like pain it's pain just like ears. feedback yeah, yeah it's it sucks, uh, it sucks yeah. to listen to it's not fun i i found it kind of unsettling <laughs> i mean yeah it sucks uh, it sucks to listen to intentionally it's a bad weird sound that should not be coming out of a rock yeah that's that is that's the horror well, creeping in they, they talk about how they feel like the, the the rock is sort of pulsing. They had strange and, dreams. Strange um, dreams. The last thing you see in the, the previous night is, like, he looks up into the sky and there's, like, sort of a distant, like, very bright strobing Strobe. light yeah. sort of shining down on him. Is that before or after he reads the bad poetry from his book? I can't remember. When does that happen? Oh, I don't know. I yeah, It's another moment. I'm just trying to think. think it feels like it's around that same the time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, it you know things get weirder and weirder. Uh, I love how when you know these 
loud bangs in the desert start happening on the second night, Mm -hmm. you hear all these animals just wailing, just a cacophony of distant animals just screaming. Um, I, I found that really effective. Yeah, well, I mean, the I'd say the film's strongest suit for me is the sound design. Because yeah. um, so much of especially the second half is like you can really barely tell what's happening on screen. You can't like... Yeah. Oh, you just can't see shit. I, I, I kind of love how it's shot because you only see little bits and pieces and... You know, it's kind of the Jaws effect. Yeah, you, just the beam so of the, much is of the flashlight the flying around. Because of that. And, you know, some of that is filled in with the sound design. Which, you know, like you said, the sound design is great. It's really evocative. And, you know, it makes it all the easier to kind of fill in, you know, in your head. Yeah. Um, well, it, it, it makes you wonder, like, what is making a lot of these noises. And just, like, I don't know, it's... It like the 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 legacy of the Blair Witch is very obvious on this movie because um, it's similarly a movie where a lot of it is running around at night with a flashlight where you can't really tell what's going on but you can hear things happening and sort of like imagining filling in the gaps in your head um, is is kind of yes, horrifying the, the, for me. The thing this movie does that the Blair Witch doesn't do is it very quickly gets bloody as hell yeah you know and basically like separates all of the characters so yeah yeah, i mean it's things on the second night like go to chaos very quickly like it basically just starts with like all of them just like in the dark screaming and running around and nobody knows what's going on and there's the boom the booming becomes sort of like a constant soundtrack for the rest of the film this this thunder these explosions or whatever and everyone gets separated it's just everybody screaming and every now and then you get like a flash of just like a shitload of blood yeah uh well one one thing that i love about it is uh kind of the fakeness of their personalities that that veneer wipes away immediately and they're kind of left to their primal selves yeah you know you hear the the one blonde girl uh you know begging for her mommy yeah which like feels like she's being reduced to like her childhood form almost yeah well i mean the the main character too who has who has the camera like from this point on like he's really the one you know we follow his perspective because he's got the camera and like he's just like babbling like a baby for like most of the rest of the movie yeah i I don't know this this movie feels like just like an, a really excellent distillation of like pure Lovecraftian horror yeah. of just like being experiencing something that is totally incomprehensible and just like completely like reduces your sanity to to nothing and yeah. like not being able to grasp what is going on around you and just like being just assaulted by sensory terror. Yeah, and I will say uh, a lot of the rest of the movie kind of focuses on Robbie's perspective. Yeah. You know, as he he got hit on the head uh, on the second night, uh, maybe by the axe man. You know, there's this weird axe man figure that he sees, and suddenly everything goes to shit from there. Well, the axe man is himself. Yes. Yeah, so spoiler, we, we I guess. We later learn that. We don't yeah. learn that right away. He gets hit on the head, which definitely doesn't help with that. I will say, you know, focusing it on Robbie's perspective so much, it's kind of a double-edged sword. Because I think it works really well for the film. But at the same time, it makes all the introduction, like we've been talking about, feel don't all really the more mean, yeah, doesn't really mean you know? anything. Yeah. 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 I mean, I'd rather spend all that time with him, though, because I think he's, yeah. he's about the le- the least insufferable mm-hmm. character in the movie, um, and especially once he is uh, reduced to naked baby stumbling around naked afraid in the afraid, dark. Yeah, naked and afraid in the afraid. dark uh, and covered in blood. <laughs> uh, then, yeah, there's, there's, nothing, there's nothing left of his personality to be annoyed by. Yeah. You know, this is this is certainly one of those those movies where I think there's room to make the found footage complain of why are you still filming throughout this? 
Honestly, um, that part I'm okay with. I, like, I, like he's just kind of carrying it along with him. Like so many of the shots are like upside down, backwards, and just being you're just being fucking slung around. You can't tell what the fuck is going on, and I, I, I honestly would have would have wished for it to be a little bit more, uh, you know, like uh, easier to look at. Um, that's a huge complaint I have personally with the second half. Is well, yeah, that, like, we know I that can't you're fucking see shit. We know that you're pretty much entirely a visual guy. Good visuals in a bad movie is enough for you, but good movie and bad visuals is not enough. <laughs> okay, well, hold on. Let's let's slow down a little bit. I think, um, like, I mean, honestly, like, I I pretty greatly prefer Skinnamarink to this movie, even. As and I'm, I know I'm the big Skinnamarink hater on the podcast, but like, just for me, there's like, there's so many sequence. There there are other sequences with like the weird flesh things and everything else but like it's it's always like punctuated by these or not punctuated but it's always in between all these moments are just shots of him running and scared and babbling like a baby where like we can't see anything like like for long periods of time in this movie we we it's just the flashlight and blood on rocks and we're we're being whipped around and bobbing and and we can't tell what's happening at all for just very very extended periods of time and like for me that that is not entertaining i don't i don't get anything out of that and i've seen a million found footage movies that have done the same thing there's a heap there's a, there's a whole fucking heap of movies like this that that do that and there are and then it's it's punctuated by like some sequences we can get into in a minute but like for the most part it's just threaded by like more of me not being able to see anything and me squinting and straining to like make anything out and I, I don't like it. I, I've learned this about myself. It's one thing to have, like, no visuals or minimal visuals and, like, telling your story with audio. I, I grew up listening to books on tape. I love, like, radio dramas, and I love I love that, that feeling of being, like, taken into something just auditorially. But the problem is, is that the visuals, to me, don't aid that. They, they hinder it. Like, they make it hard for me to, like, fucking take anything in because it's 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 eye strain it's not it's it's bad you viewer experience like it's not fun um i don't i don't get anything out. i mean i, I don't mean, think it's over i don't think it's supposed to be fun i i could not disagree with you more like yeah. i think there is always well, I don't, but it's scary either sorry i'm drinking a white claw um like uh it's it to me like like it, it just shows the frame and it takes me out of it like I think this movie, especially in the second half, just oozes with atmosphere. Yeah, there's like, constantly something going on audio-wise. Yeah, it's it's funny to me that you like this less than Skinner Inc. because I feel like so much more happens in this yeah, movie. Yeah, there's way less, like, quote-unquote, you know? going um, on in Skinner Inc. Yeah. Yeah, it's just, conceptually, I think Skinner Inc. is an earnestly original film. Like, I, I think I think it brings a lot, it has really a lot of, it has a lot of cool ideas that it brings to the table, and I, I can't stand the execution of Skinner Inc., but at least on paper, I still really like this movie. With The Outwaters, like, I've just, I've seen it so many goddamn times. I've just, I've seen so many found footage movies where they're beset by something and they fuck with time and they pitch up the audio or, you know, there's some kind of creature, but we never get to see much of any of it. Like, and it's just, I, I just, I keep seeing this movie happen again and again. And I, and it doesn't, to me, do, do anything. Other than just be an insufferable experience that's not fun to watch. Um, and when I say fun, I mean, like, or, or scary or... It doesn't need to be, like, a fun happy movie like it can be scary but like have like intent to it and i just i don't i mean i think I it has it. tons of intent yeah and i i think some of the night sequences this feels like a tour ship. uh it for me the night sequences work really well because they they you know transport robbie to different locations quite a bit you know he kind of explores this cave which turns into this weird like cylinder and then he gets shot into like water bloody water sort of it's like a, a, a the the motherhood thing it's like the, yeah. there's this tunnel this that we keep seeing and yeah he ends up in like this l 
pool of liquid and they're this like red gooey liquid and there's like the sound of a heart it's like he's being like su- sucked into a womb and then like reborn like out. over and over well, and again right after he's like pulling what looks like almost like Sausage a placenta cases. off of him a placenta is yeah. what i read as you know considering kind of the themes of motherhood and whatnot yeah and and dur- and we see the little the little tentacle creature the little shrieking tentacle creatures that are running around um they're, they're, they're just little guys I... but they're like uh they're like i i read yeah. that as like umbilical cords kind yeah. of yeah yeah and they kind of take the 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 form of like weird like flesh snakes they introduced uh, uh a rattlesnake early in the movie mm. and i think you're supposed to kind of re you know interpret those as sort of like spermy flesh snakes of sorts i know cleave you thought they look like sausages like well, sausage it's, it's not that they look like sausages it's like, like like the idea of like flesh snakes and like you know like organs writhing around and like trying to and like chasing after them and screaming and just being an agony is like cool to me but like i just i feel like the actual technical filmmaking of it is cheap like it's it just they're just dragging them on strings. They're, I mean, this like, movie was made for like less than fifty thousand yeah, dollars. It's like it's a, it's a micro it's a micro budget film. Yeah, and I think and I think they're shoot, you're shooting. I, I think they I look, think they look good, I think honestly. they look fine. Yeah, you I know, think there's a lot of good practical effects in this movie. Yeah, I mean, they they're never on on camera for very long. Like they sort of just like scurry by. Yeah, I like, think it's it always, fine. It always cuts like super conveniently. Like I. I, I it, that's that's another like point of intent where it it feels more like just like intentional editing because like they had very little to work with than it does like that the the footage was destroyed or damaged. It's it's like, you know, they're just like pulling these sausage casings around on screens and like and and cutting conveniently and like it doesn't it just doesn't feel like found footage to me. Like it doesn't feel like a like a Trash Humpers or a Blair Witch, where like I feel like I we we found this footage and we're we're witnessing something we shouldn't see. Like I don't, I don't get this out of this. It, it just, it feels, um, it feels too dramatic, too Hollywood. Like, and at the same time, I don't know what things I've seen before, but Holly calling this movie Hollywood is such a weird criticism to leverage. At. I, I just, I, I feel like I watched a different movie than you, man. Like same. I just do not, yeah. I do not get what you're talking about at all. Like I, this is, this is like. Like I said, this is like purely distilled like cosmic horror, I think. Like I I love how you can't see anything. It feels like running around alone and scared in the dark while everything is going to hell around you and just being reduced to like your basest self and yeah. being spat out and reborn over and over again. I love yeah. the the sequence where he kind of is almost Robbie is almost transported to his mom's house and he sees the vision of his mom covered in blood. Um, Yeah. I'm kind of on the fence about that. Like I, I, I get that there's the movies obviously playing with like being transported around like time and, and place. Um, I don't know, there's something that feels kind of weird and disjointed about being sent to, like, uh, an entirely different location in the middle of all this. Like, being brought back yeah. into, like, you know, like a house. I don't know. It, it It's fine. That It doesn't really bother me too much. Um, I don't I don't know if it's as effective for me as, as the other stuff. But, again, like, it is trying to say something about, yeah, uh, I mean, about moms. There's... What is it saying about moms? <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, it's it, to me. It feels like a half thunk thought. It it feels like a, a theme, but they're not really bringing anything to the table. Like it's like you got a girl shouting, "Mommy!" Her mom died. There's a mother there, but like, what is it? What what is it, what's it get? Yeah, I don't know. Like, I I feel like it's I feel like it's trying to say something about like the violence of like the inherent violence of of childbirth and being like ripped from like a warm and comfortable place into like an extremely like hostile external environment like which is what birth is it's very bloody you know the first thing you do as a baby is you're crying like i i don't like 
there's again like multiple times we see like this sort of like spiraling cylindrical tunnel and he's like literally pulled into a womb at a certain point and there's like multiple versions of him like he is the axe man and everybody we're seeing throughout all of these like throughout the whole second half of the film is always just like covered in blood but they don't seem to be injured at all so it's like what is that blood that they're covered in and like there's this some something in the sky like the, they keep talking about like the sky tearing open and we see like this strobing flashing light and it's like kind of like a gate at times i don't know there's it, there's a lot of there's a lot of like vaginal imagery yeah, I mean, to, to me it feels like a descent into hell like i i think yeah one of the the repetitions it's very really hellish like is that you know there's kind of visions of normalcy that Robbie tries to grasp onto. You know, he sees visions of his former team, you know, the the rest of the gang walking by, you know, and he, you know, screams for them and tries to chase to them, but he can never quite reach them. And even (laughs) later, he looks through uh, an airplane window and sees his brother traveling to to you know come to do the yeah. shoot the third card is really weird to me because it feels so off the rails and schizo at times that it feels less literal and more like robbie's perspective yeah um to me that works i i'd love that because you know even though it kind of sidelines the literal found footageness of it i think the uh the interpretive nature of like seeing through what robbie is seeing is so much more engaging yeah i i almost feel like the it's like two different movies in one like i i th- i really think that you could just like if you really wanted to go ballsy with it is just like start the movie at the beginning of the third card, just like give the framing of like, these people went out to shoot a music video. They, they disappeared a few years later. Somebody found the memory card and just start it there in the third card. Like you would lose like some of the context that the stuff before it provides. But like the third the third part is just like the second half of the movie is just like so like abstract and surreal yeah. that like I don't I I I really don't feel like the first half of the film adds anything to it. Well, no. Here, here's and again, I, I respect kind of the bait and switch nature of it, you know, kind of lulling people into thinking it's one kind of movie and then kind of just fucking going full schizo with yeah. it. Yeah. But I don't know if it the the ends justify the means. Crazy idea, but here's here's another take. What if instead of just cutting the whole introduction of the film, you just wrote it with compelling characters? Like like what if, what if you actually like made you actually made your first hour of your movie like compelling? Like like and gave, gave like gave us like interesting characters to be worried about <laughs> when they do go insane. I mean, I don't think it would particularly affect the second half of the film one way or yeah. another. I, it would definitely make the first half more uh, less of a chore to watch. I don't disagree with you there, but I, mean, uh, I, I, I still about think the characters like and and these events happen to them. I just I feel like I'd I'd be a little bit more buckled in, like as opposed to like perturbed by the film. Um, I mean, I, I, might, I might feel very differently about this movie. Like, if if I was like brought to be interested in all in what happened to these shitty people. The, the weird thing too is like they're shitty people. We agree on that. Like, uh, but but they're not so shitty that like I feel catharsis for what happens to them. Like, what am I supposed to be like? I mean, they like just worried like for them. Normal people, right? Am yeah. I supposed to be like worried for like what's happening to them, or am I supposed to feel catharsis for them dying? And like instead, I'm kind of left with this like kind of boring middle ground. Neither. Like, I, I really think you're. Care. I think you're supposed. To, I think you're supposed to be in the experience with them. How you feel about them is secondary. Like the whole second half of the movie, like totally reduces any sort of character that existed prior to that to nothing. And I, I think that it's, it's like a primal experience. Um, 
I just, just I like, feel like if I'm supposed to experience this with the characters, then I should like relate with the characters. That's like just part of movie making, right? Like, I don't like think you found, have to found footage or not, like, like Blair characters. Witch, like the characters are insufferable, sufferable, but you still care about them. Like you're still intrigued by what's going to happen with them. Yeah, I, I, sure, but Blair Witch is a bit more straightforward. You know, like it's it's less surreal in in the second half, and like I think I think part of the the whole point of the back half of this movie is like the annihilation of like character essentially but the the annihilation of self like don't i don't you think that would be more effective if the characters that were being annihilated were like had texture and were like compelling no because because at that point it becomes about like me being annihilated too like that i am i am seeing through like this lens and i am in that experience and i am lost and stumbling and running around in the dark i and, think yeah like it, it's a truly cosmic horror and having normie ass characters makes to a lot of people i'm sure makes it feel relatable but at the same time i think having memorable characters would make it feel a little less like it it happened circumstantially uh you know i i think with the the framing of this being kind of found cards you know you want normal characters so when things are not normal yeah i think plenty of people can relate to these types of characters i think that we're not those type of we're not those people but i mean i work with people like this yeah. like this is like these are these people are are just what like normal people are like I, they're not they're not fucking like they're... they're not weird gremlins like us I, like i know but like i i just i i kind of come from like almost another angle like i i feel like normal people can be more intriguing than these characters were set up to be like i don't I, know man normal people are fucking boring my life's boring uh, like i i like there's there's a there there's a mundanity to it that i think is natural like yeah i don't i don't enjoy spending time with these characters but it's because i wouldn't enjoy hanging out with these people in real life but i think plenty of people would find these characters like perfectly relatable I don't think that that's like no, I I think that that's more our problem than the movie's problem. I don't know. To me, this movie does such a great job just nailing atmosphere in the second half that like I can forgive a lot of its shortcomings and it does have shortcomings oh yeah it does yeah. and like when we were watching this i'm i i was really like feeling a lot of times i'm like okay when is this going to get going for me the payoff was well worth the the build-up i didn't necessarily enjoy the build-up but i was just like so sucked in like when shit started happening and just like feeling like i was being fucking dragged through the desert by my own guts it really like, feels like an assault too because like you get yeah. so much blood and gore and viscera you know we haven't even mentioned the uh the cosmic giant creature that was my favorite part of the movie because i i did not expect it i did not see it coming and it's so cool and yeah, it's just like at one point he stumbles upon a creature and it for just like two minutes, it's just like him sort of like slowly playing the flashlight like over it and you get like a sense of texture and you get a sense of size kind of, but you get absolutely no sense of like what it actually looks like. And I feel like that that is just like... Lovecraft couldn't have done it better himself. Yeah. If, no, if, if anything, if incredible. anything, Lovecraft describes his creatures a little bit too much. No, I, I think like, okay. So a minute ago, wait, sorry, I, I'll let you keep going first. Keep keep. No, no, no. The scene. By okay. all means. All right, sorry. Let me come in and shit on your shit. Um. Uh. So earlier you mentioned the Jaws effect, and you're talking about like the the idea of you know like the in 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 storytelling and in movies to the of imagination. The, yeah, three blind men and the elephant right like mm -hmm. ooh, one person is you know like 
just touching the elephant because he can't see. One person is, you know, hearing the elephant because he can't, whatever. Like, the point is, is, like, you have, you have several people touching different parts of the elephant and gaining something different from it. The Jaws effect. In Jaws, you don't see the creature for so much of the time. It's it's alluded to, uh, same with the original Alien, um, or like any of these other great movies. But there's 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 payoff at the end. You do eventually learn, oh, it's an elephant. And you don't have to. I get it. Sometimes leaving things to mystery is good. But again, I I, I feel Cloverfield does something similar here. Where, where like the mo the majority of Cloverfield, you don't see the the kaiju that's destroying New York. But at the very end, you get some fucking payoff. Like, you get that final shot where it's, like, breathing all weird and it's, like, looking down at the camera and it eats the guy. Like, um, and I, I just, I, I, I thought the, the, the shot where it's, like, tracking over the creature was neat for a minute, but then it, it kept going and it keeps, like, tracking around and he's, we're, we're, we just can't see enough of anything just to know, like, other than, like, okay, there's a creature here. What does it mean? How does this relate to motherhood? How does this relate to anything else that's happening right now? I don't know. There's just a cool creature, isn't it neat? And then, and we never get payoff with it. We never see it again, as far as I know. Maybe like in all the shaky bits, I, I blinked and I missed something. But like, I, I don't. We don't get anything else with this thing other than just like that. Yeah, I, I think I think it's fantastic. I think the payoff is that is exactly that. I think you know it contextualize some of the things that happened before in the movie and it also you know later on one of the final scenes of the movie we get robbie finds a tooth of it on yeah. the desert floor oh i just thought that was like a shark's tooth no it, it's it supposed like to be the creature it's like one tooth. of the spike the creature's like yeah. covered in spikes it's like one of the spikes on its yeah, on okay. its uh body it's like because it was like the it's the outwaters, so it's like oh at some point this there was like water. Well, I mean, yeah, it looks it looks like a shark's tooth, but like well, it, when sure it when like, he's it's a literally a shark's tooth, isn't it? Okay, but the point is when he's playing the flashlight over the creature, it's covered in spikes the same size. They could they look like shark's teeth. Like it is it is one of the same things, but yeah, he uses that to like cut his dick off um and then disembowel himself and he drops a dildo in front of the camera yeah <laughs> we, we all laugh at like how he, he he cut off his dick and it looks like a, a big dildo well yeah, i mean i just prop. wasn't i just wasn't expecting to see a severed penis in extreme yeah. close-up on the camera yeah. um well and again, kind of a shock like, laugh it's it's so wild to think of like the first 20 minutes of this movie and the last 20 minutes yeah. of the movie and the, the journey from one to the other is so dramatic and insane to me i, um, I do i do want to go back to the creature though and sure. and push back on what cleveland is saying because like i think that don't don't make that face no i think by all means that's what i'm saying um i i do th i think that like, I would not want to see, like, a full shot of this creature that is, like, well lit. First of all, this movie doesn't have the budget for it. And anything they showed us more than what they did would almost certainly look laughably cheap. You're and already complaining I, I about the, the intestine snakes. At times, they, they push the limits of that. Yeah, I think it would really look laughably cheap. Also, I think that, like, again... We're, we're talking cosmic horror to go back to Lovecraft. Like, I think that this creature is, like, the perfect idea of, like, a Lovecraftian monster. That you don't get a... Uh, it's so big, it's so colossal, you don't get a good impression of it. And also, it's so huge that you are below its notice, that you are insignificant to it. Like, the monster doesn't bend down and eat him or something. He stands there for, like, two minutes, like, looking at it with his flashlight, and it does nothing to him. And I feel like that, combined with its scale, is just, like, such a great, like, indication of, like, his insignificance in whatever this, like, horrible incomprehensible thing is that it's like he is below like it's it doesn't like you're you're not going to pick up and eat an ant that walks up next to you you know you might look down and notice it's there and then you look away you don't fucking care it doesn't mean anything to you like what what does an ant mean to to a human right like that's that's the the opinion i get in that eventually he just like turns around and runs away it's like yeah i would fucking too 
Yeah, I, I, I absolutely adore how the creature is shown. I, I again, just pure cosmic horror, like you were saying. Um, the power of suggestion is so strong between what we do see texturally and the sound. I think the sound is really good in that section. Yeah, too. we get a nice, a nice good creature roar at one point. It's like, yeah, that sounds like a, a bad creature. Again, just like the film, the film is so full of great sound design. <coughs> what did y'all think about the heads on the pikes? Um, uh, uh, the one of the go to sleepy little baby character, like her, her head, like there is a close up of it, looked pretty good. The other ones looked bad in daylight. Like, um, there were some early shots where he's kind of like moving around them, and it's sort of dark and. The camera's shaking, and, like, it looks fine. It looks whatever. But, like, there is... The, then, like, we see it in broad daylight, and, like, the, some of the other heads look pretty cheap. Uh, I... her, her face looked good, though. Like, that's fine. Yeah, I think they look fine. I, I, I think they're good effects. Like, the heads have, like, had their faces, like, peeled off, like, or, or cut off or something. They, yeah. they don't really have faces. So they're mostly just, like, kind of... Uh, Flesh with hair. Flesh with hair stuck on the pikes, and it's like, oh yeah, he's the axe man, so at some point during all of this, he, you know, murdered his friends, presumably. He finds the the shark tooth or the creature spike or whatever, um, cuts cuts his dick off. (laughs) Right after he cuts his dick off, it does have kind of a shot where, like, the camera is, like, back-facing his body, um, (laughs) And it just reminded me of the of the fucking uh, uh, scene in Silence of the Lambs where where Buffalo Bill like tucks his dick between his legs like would you fuck me? I was just like waiting. <laughs> I was just waiting for uh, Goodbye Horses to come on. <laughs> um, I I do think th- uh, while we're wrapping this up and talking about yeah. the effects, like after he cuts his dick off, he like disembowels himself. Um, and it's sort of just, like, walking around for a little while. We get some really great shots of, like, the camera pointing down just, like, at his guts, like, spilling out of yeah, his stomach like, on the ground. his intestines. Yeah, I, I think those effects look really good, yeah. actually. Yeah. Um, and and then he sets the camera down and, like, walks out into the desert. And we, you know, see him from behind as, like, the rest of his intestines, like, spill out onto the ground and he collapses. I thought the I thought the especially for the film's budget, like all those effects look looked mm-hmm. pretty damn good. I didn't really like the intestines a bit. I thought uh I thought like the intestines themselves, like those uh those props were fine. Um like pretty good. But uh I think that like the way like we're seeing it off camera, like I just thought it was like really obvious and apparent that he's just kinda like holding them off camera and I mean, then like of dropping course he them. Is. And then like the shot where he's walking away, like it's just really clear he's just sort of like holding them. And, like, you can see it in his physicality, like, while he's walking away, that he's just, like, holding the prop in front of him. And I think that, like, that could have been shot in a way to mask that. Um, I mean, I think it looked like it would if you were, if your stomach was open and you were trying to keep your intestines from spilling out on the ground, you would be holding them in front of you. I, I don't know, I think that's... Oh, uh, like, the character, like, he doesn't care. Like, he's the one who spilled his intestines. Like, why, why is he holding them? Why would he be holding them up? Like, that's the thing. Like, it doesn't really, like really jive for me like it's just I, like I, you can see the strings i don't um, i mean he's gone he's lost his mind like why are, i don't think you need to try to rationalize those things he's gone he's gone insane maybe he cut his intestines out he cut his stomach open and then regret it and is trying to hold his intestines in oh my god what did i do i don't know i like i that's a that's a fucking weird nitpick yeah. it's just the end of the movie it's the big climax i just yeah i think it's a great ending yeah I think it's I think it's a fantastic final shot of him walking out into the desert, you know, with his with his gut spilling out. I think it's I think it's it's nasty yeah, and horrible. Yeah, he's kind of submitted to the hopelessness of the situation and just kind of ended it. Yeah, he's ending it. Yeah. I think it's great. Yeah. I mean, I I think I think the credits the credits are bad. Yeah, yeah, and then it immediately like, cuts to the, like, the credits like, are like, over... yeah, Way overly manufactured. Yeah, and like the shot of where it's like the outwaters, but the O is white and the rest of it's red. And like, look at what is that? Yeah, mean? no, like, it, o, the that's O all... waters. Why is the O white? The outwaters. No, the outwaters. Yeah, and then like, like, like really Canadian. pretentious credits, like um, where it's just really feeling itself. And I don't, 
And I was a yeah. Fan the of the credits the credits sequencer is like that. That shit is is overly mm-hmm. rot. That's, Which again, like that's that. It's things like that just sort of flag the rest of it to me. Is like, I don't know. Like I I, I start to wonder and question about the intent. Like I think. So. I mean, I think, I think the intent is is pretty clear. Yeah. Um I I did see one funny tidbit on Wikipedia. I was I was looking at some of the 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 distribution of this it got a very limited release obviously yeah. but the the premiere for the after party they had an after party in like brooklyn or whatever and they screened trash humpers for it nice hell yeah good taste <laughs> good taste which uh was very funny to me but also like also very weird abstract found footage yeah i mean Robbie Banfitch is obviously like a, a quote unquote film guy, you know. Yeah. So it doesn't it doesn't um God, doesn't, doesn't surprise me. That's yeah, a Trash really, Humpers. That's a really good found footage movie. Right? Trash we Humpers can all agree is on great. That. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that, yeah. That absolutely. movie it feels like you actually found a be Trash Humpers is a uh, Trash Humpers is in a league of its own. Harmony Corinne is in a league of his yes. own. Mm-hmm. Um also I'm I'm pretty sure this is much like Kyle Edward Ball like this is Robbie Banfitch's first film. I'm pretty yeah. sure young filmmaker um first first steps um I did see as well online that he released a couple of like supplemental shorts. Oh really? Kind of adding additional Hmm. Material context, I don't know. I haven't watched them. Um, I would. I, I think this movie I stands on out. its own pretty well, um, but I would be curious to see how those turn out. I will say, while we're talking about the actual creators and stuff, I really, you know, like is as bitter as I might get about the film and as grumpy old man as I am, I of course don't hold any like anything against the actual creators or makers of the movie. Like I think, you know, if they want to keep on trying to, you know, pursue their dream and make more films, like I, I do cheer that on. I'd much rather take someone who swings for the fences that's than someone who Yeah, I mean we need we need yeah. more experimental film getting more like exposure and we need more experimental filmmakers and I think the horror genre is a, a great place for it and I appreciate it and you know like c- both Robbie Banfitch and Kyle Edward Ball are just like very regular ass dudes like they both have online presence and they both seem like very down to earth and unpretentious to me yeah. um and just have like you know very particular tastes and what they like and what they want and you know uh specific visions about what they're trying to accomplish and i think they both uh succeed to to uh you know uh, a certain degree and not to say that they both don't have, you know, room to learn and improve, but hell, man, I, I think this is I think this is a, a, a strong debut. Yeah. I'm going to go ahead and rate this because yes. we, yes. we have a whole other movie yes. to talk about. This is going to be a long ass episode. Um, but fun one. The next movie is good. Yeah, I <laughs> well, Probably a we'll, we'll, get, we'll get we'll get to that. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, you know, I. I I, I, I do admit, like, the, the first hour of this movie uh, is is a chore. I would describe it as a chore. Um, for for me, the the whole second half, like, very much paid off. Um, I, I just, like, loved how chaotic and surreal and, and cacophonous it all was. Um, really, really evocative and visceral. Um, I'm going to give this, I'm going to give this a strong three and a half. Um, man, that first hour... <laughs> Yeah, I agree. It's a little too long. Um, I do have to respect the complete descent into like a schizo nightmare that it becomes. I don't think I've ever seen a movie like this kind of descend into hell in such an atmosphere way like it does. Um, And I really respect how obtuse and abstract and ambiguous a lot of that is. Um, I totally understand that if you don't get on the wavelength of this movie, you're not going to have a good time. Just like Skin of Marine. You know, I, yeah, especially like Skin of Marine, um, but to a certain extent, even more so. If you don't like slow burns either, you're going to have an especially hard time. Um, but stick with it. If you like weird cosmic horror, I think you'll have a good time. I think it's a good movie. I'm going to give it a four out of five. I think it's a great debut. 
All right, Cleveland, bring that average down. Oh, I will, baby. Um, yeah, so, you know, like, doing movie nights, we watch a lot of these, like, found footage movies and, you know, compare them to, like, other great found footage movies, whether it's, like, Blair Witch or Trash Humpers, like we previously mentioned. And, like, I, I think that there's a lot of lower budget, even lower budget, like, horror films out there that, like, deserve just as much show and respect and love and appreciation that, like, aren't even that good. Like, like there's there's a lot of movies out there, whether it's, like, the fucking... It's, like, Hell House LLC or Paranormal Farm or The Curse of Professor Zardonicus or, like, any of these, like, kind of lower-budget sort of found-footage movies where they're just, like, just a bunch of people with a camera in the woods. They're just trying something. And uh, they, they hit gold. Or, in some cases, like, it's at least so bad it's fine. And, like, I, I find myself... Like, I find those things to be a little bit more entertaining than this movie. Um, uh, uh, even... Um, like, Horror in the High Desert 2. I didn't like the first one, but, like, the second one has some, like, pretty unique sequences in it that are, like, pretty disturbing. And they feel, like, earnestly, like, disturbing. Um, uh, that, that I would, I would, I would rather watch again. Um, so, I don't know, I'm gonna give it, like, a, just a, I, I wanted to give it a lower rating, but, like, I think, I think a 2 is fine. I think, like, it's... Go with your gut. Yeah, like, a 2 is good. Like, it's, um, uh... There, there are like a couple of shots that that are that are neat, um, uh, but I don't I don't like the payoff. I don't think it brings anything to the table that like says anything that new for me. Um, it certainly didn't scare me. It it just left me annoyed, um, and I didn't find like the acting to be like earnest or genuine enough. Like in the babbling and in all the craziness and everything in the second half and when they're calling for their mommy, I don't buy it. Um, it didn't. Uh, it didn't, it didn't speak to me. Um, and I don't like saying that. I, I like having a good time watching a movie. I like, you know, enjoying these films. And I, of course, I love Lovecrafty and stuff and, like, those descents into madness. But for me here, I was just too taken out of it by, like, not caring for these characters and everything I've already said. So watch it for yourself and see. You know, let us know, like, kind of where you sit. I, I'm always curious to hear more, more takes and everything on this stuff. But for me, pretty confidently, it's a two. Honestly, that surprises me because I expect, you know, the way you were talking about it, it seemed like a half star or one star. So my thing is, like, I if this movie had, like, a multi-million dollar budget, I would probably rate it even lower. But, like, as I, I do have a lot of respect. I still have a lot of respect for young filmmakers with little money, like, trying to do something unique or whatever. And, like, while I don't feel like this movie is that unique, I still respect and understand that making movies, even bad ones that I don't like, is hard. Like, it's it's hard making movies, and I, I still, I respect these, like, lower budget films that are trying to do with what they can with what little they have, and try and, like, make their dreams happen and fucking make movies. Like, I, I will, I'll always respect that. And and for that, like, that's at least worth another star. I think that, that says it all. You know, it's, it's uh, and, and frankly, a two out of five is fine. Like, it's, uh... My, my problem with this movie really is not, like, that it's the worst movie I've ever seen. It's just weird to me that this movie is getting so much praise when there's plenty of other great found footage movies that don't get fucking talked about that, frankly, do... that try more unique things. That that try, like, uh, to really break the mold. And uh, that's, that's, frankly, like, really why I, I'm, I'm bothered by this movie more than anything else. And uh, that's okay. Like, it's not that big of a deal. It's not, like, a huge soapbox to stand on. It's fine. I mean, I think there's a whole argument to be had there, but we do not have time for it. So Whoa. that'll give the Outwaters an average of 3.2 out of 5, and we're going to move right along yes, uh, into our next film, which is The Pope's Exorcist, uh, directed by Julius Avery, starring Russell Crowe. Um, Julius Avery, we have actually talked about on the podcast before, uh, he directed Overlord. Oh, okay. Um, no shit. I, yeah. I really enjoyed Overlord. I enjoyed Overlord as well. That's why I missed um, for the podcast. Um, Still haven't seen, but I heard... I, it's, pretty, see, it's pretty It's like, pretty good. Like, yeah, it's, it's pretty fun. good. It's a yeah. fun movie. It I looks don't, fun. I don't think it's great, but like it is definitely fun. Yeah. All right. So this movie is uh, is one of those inspired by a true by true events <laughs> movies big big emphasis on inspired i mean i feel like it's that. especially <laughs> a trope with exorcism movies yes 
Oh my um, God, is yes. it ever? Sure, sure. So yeah, this movie is uh, quote unquote based on slash inspired by books and files uh, written by uh, uh, a man, Father Gabriel Amorth, uh, who was the chief uh, exorcist at the Vatican from like 1986 to like 2016 or something like that. The Pope's exorcist. Uh, yeah. William Friedkin did a documentary uh, about him several years ago. Yeah, it wasn't Heard it was very not very good. good. Yeah, um, but um, Friedkin has clout, you know. So. Yeah, um, this this movie is uh, beat for beat almost every exorcism movie you've ever seen in your life, uh, except we've got uh, at its at its heart and and center. Fantastic performance by Russell Crowe <laughs> yes. as uh, as Father Amorth. Um, See, I I we can we can dig into it, but broad level, I think my thing with this movie is Russell Crowe does a great job, you know, elevating this movie, but it still has a hard time overcoming the just tropes of the the subgenre. Yeah, we even said like late in the movie, like it's just checking boxes at this point. Like yeah. it is, yeah. it is like I someone's crawling on the ceiling. It checks, you know, it checks all of the boxes of of just like exorcism movie, fucking possessed kid trying to uh, make a priest lose his faith, foul mouthed, cursing, crosses crab turning walking. upside down, crab walking. Um, tying a kid to the bed, giving him scary contact lenses, being thrown across the room, room, praying at it real hard. Is there any vomit shit, though? Uh, the the Pope vomits blood. Yeah, Uh, yeah, yeah, later in the movie. Underutilized. We'll talk about that part more (laughs) later. But I, I do think Julius Avery, um, you know, with his experience with things like Overlord, brings sort of campy over the topness to some yes. aspects oh, of yeah. it. Oh yeah. I mean it's campy um, for sure. And like it's it's a perfectly competently made movie, you know, like yeah. like Julius Avery is a, a I professional. Think, I think it has flourishes a very entertaining camp. Yeah. But I don't think it goes far enough still. Nah. I, I wish it would just go balls to the wall a little bit more. Because like when it does, it's amazing. Yes. Yeah, those, those 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 few moments where like they're really punctuated are fucking great touchdown moments. We were giggling, laughing, and shouting. Yeah, but like, actually, oh, this is a dumb. This is what? a dumb guy. Uh, I was gonna say dudes rock movie, but this is Jesus and the Catholic Church yeah. rocks movie. Yeah. Hey, Jesus, I mean, Jesus, Jesus was a dude. Jesus was a dude. Absolutely. Jesus was a dude, and the <laughs> Catholic agree. Church is mostly dudes. Yeah, dude. And I like this w- movie, I don't know yeah. if I would argue that they rock, but this movie sure does. No, <laughs> this, this movie does. This movie is all about Jesus rocking, and I'm here for it. But like, um, no, Ben, you, you bring a point. Like, you wanted like it to go even. Cra- what are some examples of that? Like, what would you? What would you kind of want? Well, I think we get some great uh, moments where, like, for example. We get giant explosions. I think the opening sequence is a great example Sick. because and we're introduced to Love Father and Moore. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, he walks into a, a small village um, and uh, he finds this boy or young man i guess yeah uh, he's been called there yeah. as an exorcist to perform an exorcism on yeah. this young man who's and he possessed. sort of coaxes the demon he negs the demon yeah well, or <laughs> satan yeah so yeah you know what he goes by to uh uh possess a pig it's like a oh yeah old hog it's like i bet you i bet you can't you're so weak you can't even possess this pig he literally negs the yeah. demon quote unquote into uh into being like oh just watch me i can possess that pig and then the moment it's the, in moment, the, pig. the, the moment the moment pig like does like a, ro- a little like pig roar yeah it squeals a little bit and they <laughs> shoot it and blast. Blast. they fucking blast it in the head with the, with the shotgun it's, it's so funny incredible. later late not that much later in the movie like he's being called before like some uh like regulatory board or whatever it's like <laughs> this this inve- this exorcism was not approved by the archdiocese or whatever and he's like well it's because it wasn't an exorcism that boy wasn't pre- possessed he was just mentally ill I just tricked him into thinking that he 
sent the demon into the pig and then killed the pig, so now he's not mentally ill anymore. It's like, yeah, bro, that is for sure how mental illness works. It's on 4D chess shit. I yeah. love it. See, this is one of those scenes where I feel like it really shows that the, the script was overcooked. Because oh, bro, this movie is fucking stupid. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. it's but fucking it's funny, stupid. stupid. It's like overridden to hell, uh, because you can tell where it, like they readjusted based on executive notes and producer notes so often, because it starts in Italian, and Russell Crowe speaks quite a bit of Italian in this, and well, too say, surprisingly well, yeah. very well. And, uh, you know, in his... It, it, coming from those people, people who don't speak Italian, his, but, like, it... it, it passable pa- passable yeah, enough for yeah. non-Italian like the audiences. the nuances and, like, yeah. everything that from, like, he you know, sounds, like Yeah, he sounds, like, with all of the other actually Ita- actual Italian actors, he doesn't sound yeah, particularly out really of place. Well, yeah. 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 For outside perspective. Like. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a move that the movie is making that they didn't have to do. Yeah, and totally. you can yeah. see that they wanted to do that probably way more, but at a certain point, they got the <laughs> studio notes. Yeah, you know, I because I mean, this is a pro- disciplinary is- hearing. They're like, you have to speak English. Yeah, this is an official hearing, and the 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 main priest who's like carrying out is like American. He's and yeah, sure, sure. I understand it for that scene. For the, almost the rest of the movie, it's completely yeah. in English. There's like a one-on-one he has with the Pope, where like they're both Italian. Why are they? Speaking also, well, yeah, that's that's the most egregious example of it to me because later in the movie, I I totally buy it because yeah, yeah, yeah. because like the the primary exorcism, like where the demon and stuff is, is in Spain. So he goes to it's Spain with an American family, right? With an American mm-hmm. family, that's a little. Eh. Um, but yeah, he. <laughs> So, so that part of the movie, he's in Spain. The other, the younger priest he meets, who we'll talk about, Tomas or whatever, is Spanish, mm-hmm. and the family who is there is American. So, for them to all be speaking English to each other as a shared language makes sure. total sense. Yeah, you know, I English is a commonality; it's a language. Right, of right, exactly. That scene in the beginning, it's all in Italian. Um, is great. Yeah, the hearing, it's like he the the priest is like because this is official hearing, we're gonna do it in English, and he and you know. I mean, one of the new nuances- as I love in that scene is uh, Father Amorth is like very well okay and he keeps speaking Italian and is kind of stubborn about it until he keeps being like born. English English yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> and it's like yeah so for that scene it, it makes sense and then after that you know he like goes to talk to <laughs> I, I love the scene and he's like if you have a problem with me you take it up with my boss the Pope <laughs> um, <laughs> this movie really, like is, is, is full cuckoo. Cuckoo. like it's just full of like one liners it's all it's like, so like, fucking stupid, like all the man. dialogue is set up for like like corny one-liners, and I fucking love that. But shit. yeah, then he goes. Like, it's he so goes, much fun. I, do, so I mean, we get one of my favorite, where he's talking about how ninety-eight percent of all you know visits are you know all of the cases uh, are like not actual actual mental illness yeah. or psychiatric or you know medical, and then the two percent that is evil. There, yeah, there's exactly. a long pause. There's a really long pause between like. Father, like, I what is it. the two percent? Two percent. I call it evil. <laughs> like, and it's just like there's so it's much so weight good. put on it's so just good. evil. You know, like fucking like uh, the the most cartoon like thing we could call it. Like, it just I love that shit, man. And it it just it keeps doing it. Like, but yeah, um, he does he does like a like before that scene. He's a uh, it's the movie like really wants you to know that this guy. He's a badass, and he doesn't play by like the normal cardinal rules because he doesn't have to. He's he the swears. Well, cardinal he swears. Cardinal rules. He swears. He makes jokes with the nuns. Like everybody loves this guy because like he's so cool. Yeah, and shit. he's like this movie he's is all about on his Vespa. This movie is all about how this dude oh, rocks. Oh, oh he rocks. This dude rocks, and, and I does. love that shit. I think it's fun. He's great. Like, well, yeah, yeah, I mean, he is. Great. He is the like. The only reason to watch this movie, oh, as yeah. far as I'm Russell, concerned, which frankly like, if is this, why I wanted to watch it. If this, Crow. yeah, well, I mean, it's it's a, such a bizarre casting. I'm, but I mean, <laughs> yeah, it is. But it's it's like we're we're at this we're in this really weird stage where like 
Russell Crowe has just been in just sort of like Drek like the past yeah, like I mean, he's, 10 years he's if been, not longer. Yeah, sectioned off to genre. Yeah, like you know, he, got, he did that unhinged movie recently. Yeah, where... I wanted to call it Drive Angry, oh, yeah. but no, that's a... <laughs> Yeah, where he's like a where he's like a, a crazy like MAGA dude in a big pickup truck yeah. or whatever with like a bad case he's... of road rage. Yeah, he's yeah. done those like the, the Australian like World War One era movies. And, yeah, like, he a few got other pieces, but like you're so right, he's he's been doing genre films, which is weird. Because... He got he got like he got like old and fat and fell out of like the limelight and has sort of just been like kicking around these genre films but i i think I that's i think it's made a lot of people forget that like yeah 20 20 years ago like russell crowe was like Chops. i want to say the, in the, like he, one of the stars and he had fucking acting. he's a great yeah, actor and, movie, and like and here's the thing we i was excited about this movie because i wanted to see russell crowe do a bad italian accent and i'm gonna eat my words Russell Crowe fucking rocks. Does a good yeah. Italian. He does a good. He speaks accent. Italian well, and, and he does engaging. a good Italian accent. It's fun, and like, like we're we're laughing, but like, like we the, the it feels authentic. He and understands like, the assignment too. Yeah. You know, he yeah, camps he's it a up when actor. it needs to be camped up, and yeah. he keeps it you know grounded when it needs to be grounded. Yeah, yeah. you know, I think he's Russell Crowe, his career kind of faded because there were some like assault allegations yeah. rap thing in the Russell Crowe fighting around the world oh yeah like, the yeah. South, South Park did the bit yeah, on yeah. about him just beating people up yeah, yeah. Um, which I mean um, if you're an actor you're constantly surrounded by pop he's Australian yeah, yeah. Yeah. and he's Australian <laughs> I can't I can't, can't rag on him too much for beating people up yeah um, I just don't know yeah I, I, I that's true I don't I don't know yeah you know but, what? you know that's probably why he's been you know relegated to genre films which I think you know he makes the most of it. He certainly shines in this movie. Yeah, well, again, like, he's the best thing about this movie, and just about anybody else, just, like, some regular, like, B to C tier actor in this role, and I just would, like, I would totally write this movie off. Like, the movie oh, yeah, the sure. movie is not good enough without Russell Crowe's performance to, like, even really be worth the time, to I me, think. there were... But... There were only two other standout actors. Franco Nero yes. plays the Pope, mm -hmm. and he's great. You know, genre film legend, the original Django, giallo, Italian, spaghetti, western legend. And I thought the young kid, the kid who is was great. possessed, yes. was fantastic. What? I thought he was terrible. <laughs> I, th I that was gonna be one I of my that was gonna be one of my big good. points about the movie. I thought the kid was awful. <laughs> really? Oh no, yeah, I think it was great. Well, well, on top of that too, like let's let's give some real credit. Oh fuck! Please tell me what of you guys know the actor's name. I yeah, feel it's bad Ra I it's Ralph Ineson. Ralph who Ineson, does, who does the voice of the demon. Ralph Ineson is always great. Ralph Ineson is always great. I think the kid is. I think the kid but, is but that's terrible. Because, but that's because Ralph Ineson always puts in work, and like I. I respect that. Like, he's great in The Green Knight, like, as the voice. He's great as the dad and the witch. Yeah. Like, uh, he's also great in Dark Souls. Like, he's he's a really good voice actor and actor as well. I love Ralph Ineson to bits. Yeah, I, I think great. his voice is awesome. I, I can never get enough of listening to his voice, and I was really excited that he was he voiced Yeah, I, but I mean, man, the... I. I thought the, yeah, the kid was very expressive, and like the makeup was really good for him too, which helped. The, yeah. the makeup, the makeup is good. Um, it's really pretty. Cool. It's generic. It's generic possessed kid makeup. Weird colored contacts and like pasty, like cut up skin with like fucked up lips yeah. and teeth. But here's the thing, like, right? like he, the kid, and also or just the demon, right? Like he never just says, "Bring me the priest." He says. Instead, like they take it to the the, the extra. I'm just saying, level. He says exactly that. Well, no, no, they they bring it to that extra level. <laughs> he and says, he goes, "I'm gonna fuck you, mommy." He says, "No, no, we'll see. Bring me the priest." <laughs> and like he does, like a <laughs> like every time, and it's like so scenery chewing and fun, and like he's constantly just making like ghoul noises. And like so, you know, he doesn't just go bring me the priest. He goes bring me the priest. Yeah. Everything you're describing like, is is what Ralph Ineson is doing, though. Is what, what the, the voice is doing? Like he's like like fucking twisting a snack and like being fun. No, and, like, See, to me that's a shared role. Yeah, I agree. They, I mean, like James Earl Jones is just as much Vader as the I guy mean, who played Vader. Yes. It is it is 100%. a shared it is a shared role, but. Uh, 
Also, we know James Earl Jones's name. You don't know the guy who played <laughs> Vader's name, right? Uh, we know we know Ralph Ineson's yeah. name. Well, that's, we don't that's because of like the politics around celebrity. That's not that's not the guy's fault. Like I, no, I know yeah. that that is that is a, a an, an oversimplification. I acknowledge yeah. that. I don't know. I I thought the kid was bad. I the like the ADR, like Ralph Ineson's voice coming out of his mouth was just weird. Like I thought Ralph Ineson <laughs> was doing a great See, I job. Yeah, but... kind of campy yeah, and yeah. fun. Like, I agree. Eh, yeah, I mean, I guess it's. I mean, See, I, I think you see the difference when the sister is possessed and how bland that is in comparison. Ooh, good point. I thought about that. Yeah, I mean, she's she's definitely more bland. She's not a particularly good actor actress. Um. Also, it's just like such a generic like the the whole the whole like American family is like a weird aspect of this movie for me. Like, I get that you have to have a kid to be possessed, but just like this contrivance of this American family, the husband died in a car accident like a year ago and his family owned for some reason uh, like an old dilapidated abbey slash castle yeah. in fucking Castile, Spain. I love how little the kids give a shit about it too. Yeah, like, well, they, they come up on like this incredible, like it's a, it's a, it's like a fucking castle, like this church, and yeah. it's like, yo, this is ours, and like the kids are like. This sucks. They're and there. Like, they're the there to. They're there to fix it up so they can sell it. Which I also feel is like every fucking haunted house demonic oh, possession is. Yeah, ass yeah, is sure. like, oh, we got this house and we're going to fix it up and we're going to make the best of our situation. And we've experienced some tragedy recently. And the older kid sure is moody and doesn't like to talk to the parents and is kind of a bitch. Uh, and the kid, the younger kid is traumatized and that leaves him uh, susceptible to dem- again. Checking, the younger kid doesn't talk at all. Checking the is, boxes is what they say. Yeah, he, well, he he hasn't he hasn't spoken since the father died because we find out later that he was in the car mm-hmm. uh, with the father when they had the accident. He saw like his dad's head impaled by like a piece of rebar. Um, so like yeah, so he hasn't spoken since then, and that leaves him susceptible to the demonic possession, whatever. Blah 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 blah. Checking off all these boxes. Any second that Russell Crowe isn't on screen is a second that I am checking the Snooze. fuck out. Snooze. Snooze. Check your phone. Snooze. Yeah, exactly. Sure. Yeah. I will. I will say. Uh, I think the other decent performance in this movie is uh, the mom. I don't remember the actress's name. Um, she's um, something. She's she, she's generic brand Winona Ryder. She's a oh. she's a she's a Mike Flanagan regular. Um, she's been oh, in a okay. couple of his Netflix series, and I I had to look up what I particularly remembered her from is she plays Wendy Torrance in Doctor Sleep. Oh, which that she's makes so much sense. It's a small part, but I remember when we talked about that Thank on you. our episode how we like we we noted how good she was at doing the yeah. Shelley Duvall impression. Yeah, yeah. she was really good. And mm-hmm. you know, she she's yeah. good enough. She's fine in this. In this. The script she, the script is bad. Everybody yeah. like She doesn't have much of a character no. in this movie. Um, S- single single mom single mom trying to do by trying to do right by her her kids, you know, yeah. by her moody children. And, and like I said to start this discussion, like I feel like this movie has flourishes of very cool and novel over the top stuff, but it can't overcome the tropes. No. Mm. Because it's so set in kind of the process of exorcism that it can't kind of revel as much as it should <coughs> in the crazy batshitness of some of the other stuff. Like how this uh, Castle Abbey was like the location of all these hidden bodies from the... From the Spanish Inquisition. The Spanish Inquisition. Yeah. And like they go fucking batshit with something. Yeah, they more. get they get fucking crazy into the law. I, I will say, uh, and we'll, we'll get to it, um, the the climax of this film is is 
probably more over the top and bonkers than most of these exorcism and movies that it. I've seen. Yeah, I won't. I won't say that it's particularly good, but it it it, it is it's like entertaining. It is it's it is like so over the top that it kind of distinguishes itself from a lot of these other exorcism films that try to stay more grounded because they're trying to convince you that it's like maybe actually based on like a real you know story. God, yeah, the, the but the fucking lore, the the, the fucking the fucking uh, Catholic revisionism, uh, fucking apologist. <laughs> like, they... I think the most egregious moment is when the 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 demon is kind of taunting uh, both Father Morth and the the Spanish priest, and the Spanish priest, his big sin is. He fell in love with a lady, and she was trying to convince him to leave leave the church, the church yeah, so they could get married. Get married, and he refused. But he told her that he would, and so his big temptation was the demon turns into her naked, wanting him to, to yeah, fuck her. Like, Ooh, yeah. But but in reality, it's still the kid. And that's, uh, <laughs> oh, uh-oh, uh-oh, Catholic. Well, yeah, I mean, he doesn't do it, of course, but, uh, well, yeah, we were, we were, in the movie. yeah, we were, we were joking, <laughs> we were joking that it's like, yeah, in this movie, all of the priests who sexually abuse children did it because the, because the devil made the kids look like a sexy lady. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I mean, the, the, the biggest, the biggest fucking, uh, sort of like apologistics that they do which i mean obviously it's a it's a fictional movie and they're you know telling a fictional story so on and so forth and it goes but, it goes so far in its way to look fictional too it feels yeah. it doesn't feel like uh, an authentic retelling of true events no, it's got explosions uh, and crazy uh, shit going uh, on of course like, not movie. but but the but the lore what they what they say what they discover yes. You know, they find this, like, old sort of, like, hidden catacomb under the abbey. They find, like, the corpse of, like, some, uh, like, 15th century exorcist that they recognize for some reason. And Russell Crowe's like, he is one of the greatest exorcists of all time. Um, <laughs> and they, they basically learn that um, the demon that is uh, uh, imprisoned here or whatever, that the church fought hundreds of years ago uh possessed this like old exorcist who is credited with like convincing the queen of spain to like found the spanish inquisition so they're saying that uh they're, they're basically like all of those hundreds of years of like torture and murder that was all the work of the devil it was like oh what us <laughs> when the catholic church we didn't do that it was the devil <laughs> the, 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 the devil made us do it so oh speaking of the devil made me do it um this brings me to a point um uh, that i that i wanted to ask you guys because this uh this movie reminded me in some ways of how uh, the Conjuring movies uh, make the Warrens seem like cool yeah. people yeah. who expel demons. And I don't like what I've seen of the Conjuring films. Um, I have some peers No, they who, stink. Yeah. yeah they I, suck. I recently even have some peers who like wanted to show me like the original Conjuring film, and I think just because of all the movies that have since as I well. used I to think it was. Well. I used to think the first one was great. It does not hold up. To me, it doesn't. <laughs> they're all. Either. They're all bad. Um, and uh, again, to it's. It's always like at the expense of promoting hucksters. Yeah. Like who who earnestly like took advantage of people because like we we understand the the realities of the situation, which is that like people aren't possessed by demons. Like so, like by propagating that, like that's not really great. That's not really great. Yeah. Um, to, to make your living off of people who earnestly believe you. You're, you're, you know, you're yeah. a huckster. So, um, meanwhile, though, I, and, and I have a, well, sorry, I have a bad time with those movies. Not because of that, but just because as, as movies, I don't have a, a, a lovely time with it either. But here, this movie, frankly, I had enough of a fun time that I was willing to put that aside. Yeah. And I think it's because I, this movie, like, like, the Conjuring movies don't really have explosions in them. No. Right? Well... 
Okay, uh, in the third. I mean, the third goes. The third one. Pretty rem- fucking remember wild. how the third one starts yeah. with the fucking like ghost tornado in the fucking dining room. Yeah, in fairness. Yeah, I mean, it does. It does do a bit of that. Um, but this movie's pretty consistent with the, the explosions. Oh and, like, yeah, the, the rock music and like the, yeah, this guy's awesome. He doesn't play. God, by the man, rules. The, yeah, the number of needle uh, drops in this yeah, movie. Yeah, the they yeah. spent and, so much money on pointless needle drop yeah, yeah this is, is this true. is like, a, we, we get like the first like 10 seconds of a song and then we're moving on. several songs of several songs and then we sometimes don't sometimes them, just like kind of hearing it through like one of the kids headphones like you know, never, for five seconds for five before seconds they take yeah. it off yeah. i mean it's, well, a, it's a sony film so there's probably some like some licensing stuff where they're able to i wouldn't get some i wouldn't be su- yeah i wouldn't be surprised if they probably if sony probably owns the rights to like some of the songs they use in this movie but it yeah it was it's a surprising number of needle drops and just like weird kind of too wasted. weird just yeah. like a lot of they had a, a lot of bangers i mean oh for sure i'm stranded by the saints was one of them. yeah one of the the greatest punk songs of all time yeah there's uh, there's a lot of just like oh, i don't 80s. think the problem is like the, the the choices to me it's just like how quickly they're they're there and they're gone yeah there's just like a lot of 80s yeah pop they feel rock. Unnecessary. like it doesn't yeah, yeah it doesn't feel like it's really like the you know there's the first one like when they're like we're seeing like the overhead, the helicopter yeah. shot of them driving. Right after the title sequence. Yeah, and you you hear the music, and then we're it's like the tone for the film. It and does like, the thing where it cuts to being diegetic and like the kids' yeah. uh, headphones and stuff. There it's, it's like good. Yeah, that's fine. That's like fine. It's just like for like the next twenty minutes, like every scene has like five seconds of like some eighties pop rock song. You know, it's weird. It's, it's the whole Guardians of the Galaxy thing. Like it yeah. all, it all started there. Like every movie has to do it. Now. I don't know. I feel like it's. I feel like it's kind of trying to get at something where it's like you know these the the idea of like exorcism and like the spiritual battles and angels and demons is so like antiquated and old world but it's like this is the 80s like modern society is creeping in you know yeah um, which is fun but I, it's I but i mean I, I feel like they're trying to kind of play it that but it's like so underdeveloped that it's I, like I, the, the I, problem I, is I they don't let these songs run long enough it's a non it's a non yeah. theme i did think it's funny that like every time or once the the kid was possessed, he started listening to like thrash metal. Mm. Oh yeah, there's just like one, just one part. Like after he, uh, like gets a whiff of that Spanish gas down in the basement, <laughs> you know, we're just like lying on his bed, just like still, or just kind of like I, I couldn't I couldn't make out what song it was because like you can just hear it in the headphones. It was like he's listening to some kind of like thrash metal shit. It's like oh yeah, he's possessed now. I'm surprised they didn't have like a fucking Slayer needle drop or something. You know, at some point that would. They might been... as well have. Yeah. I mean, they might as well have. Yeah, it's like so on the nose. Um, we're talking about like goofy '80s stuff. Like m- one of my favorite recurring things is Russell Crowe's Vespa. Oh. Um, so good. Him just like driving, him he just like driving all around. the way from Rome. Bro, to that Spain. was so funny because like we get a couple of scenes of him like riding around like Rome on his Vespa, like decked out. He's got his like robes and like his scarf and the sunglasses, cool sunglasses. And, and the hat. Yeah, he looks he looks like Orson Welles. Yeah, uh, it's it's so, so funny. Like heavy set, like on his on his little Vespa. Yeah, like, but then it's, at, but it's then great. after he gets he gets his assignment from the Pope to go to uh, check out this this thing in spain we just cut to spain to the castle and him pulling up on his moped <laughs> it's like wait a second did he drive that vespa all the way from rome to spain yes. determination that's, that's yes, fucking, he did. it's fucking crazy he's determined he's because i mean what is, like what is the alternative they put it on a plane <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I no, want yeah, to I'm, believe. Or he just I'm, rented the identical vest. I'm choosing. No, I'm no, choosing no, to believe. I want to believe. Yes, yeah, because after the whole thing, because after the whole thing is over, we see him like pulling up to the Vatican on his vest. <laughs> it's like, yeah, he, you know, he he went there for a few hours. He vanquished the demon, and then he rode his Vespa all the way back. How long do you think it would take to, <laughs> to ride a Vespa from Rome to oh, Spain? God, probably like a couple days at least. 30 hours probably i love it though i love that's one of my Same. favorite parts Same. um you know you know what this movie reminded me of a lot the biggest parallel i was making to it and um this is uh i feel like 
one of my classic uh, weird pulls. Did you all see this movie? It came out in 2011. It was a possession movie called The Right with Anthony Hopkins. No, but I, I've i heard you talk about yes. it. Yes. Yeah. I've I, not seen it. Before. That's a movie that I've gone back to a number of times. It's one of those things where, like, it's not a particularly good movie, but I'm kind of, like, weirdly captivated by the Daybreakers effect. Um, <laughs> um, again, very similarly to this role, because it has, like, an incredible actor in, like, the most central role. Like, yeah. it's, that movie is, like, a very, very much like this one, checks almost all of the same boxes that this one does, a little bit less campy. But Anthony Hopkins is like the exorcist in it. And Anthony Hopkins is one of the greatest actors who's yeah. ever lived. And he yeah, is girls. so fucking good in that movie. Like every now and then I'll go back and watch it. Like just for Anthony Hopkins' performance. Like the rest of it is totally forgettable. Rutger Hauer has a bit part in it. Um, but yeah, I feel like this movie is the same way. Where it's just like I could really give a shit about like the vast majority of this movie, but Russell Crowe is so funny in this role. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, it's funny. I I feel like broad strokes for this movie, it starts really engaging and over the top, and then it kind of falls in the second act into yeah. kind of the mediocre valley of stuff we've seen before. Yep. And then in the third act, it gets kind of wild again, and we get flourishes of that greatness. I will say one of the biggest things that I wish it would have leaned harder into is it's a movie called The Pope's Exorcist, and we get uh, hints of Pope possession in that, like, the Pope projectile vomits blood on someone. Yeah, it's like the weird... The, they do this thing where the Pope is, like, weirdly, like, spiritually connected to to Russell Crowe, where, like, when Russell Crowe gets possessed by the demon, uh, that, like, the Pope, like, feels it all the way in Rome. I like yeah. how... Well, they're, they're spiritually connected, like... The, the Pope's exorcist is is the man who the Pope has entrusted to hold the armies of Satan back against mankind. Yeah, like, right. Like, their their connection, I'm, I'm weaving my fingers together, like, is so tight and so fundamental that if he, if, if, if Russell Crowe goes down, the whole papacy is Their boyfriends. It all goes down. Is, yeah, oh, their yeah. Their boyfriends, oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Dudes rock. They've explored each other's bodies. And sometimes For kiss. sure. Dude for rock. sure, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, man. No doubt. Yeah. Um, I, I like how he sends Russell Croft to do the mission. He's like, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to keep researching, uh, while you're, while you're gone. And like later he's like, uh, you know, he, he finds the book and like all of the shit is redacted because, you know, the church wants to cover up the fact that the Spanish Inquisition was caused by somebody being possessed by a demon. But then he finds like an old letter and it's basically just like, uh, it's basically just like this demon that's in this place is like one of the most powerful demons ever, and the Pope gets so scared he has a heart attack. Yeah, <laughs> I, I it's do. his motive. And almost dies. He's like he's like, oh my god, the most powerful demon. <laughs> <laughs> Just from the... reading a letter. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> he like reads a letter and gets scared. Yeah, and he like throws up blood later when like Russell Crowe is, is like about to get possessed. But it's like, why, why? The, the, other, the, the American priest, too, like, while Russell Crowe's possessed, he's, like, in the church, and, like, the crucifix, like, starts bleeding, like, from its nipples. Like, the Christ on the cross starts bleeding from his nipples. Christ is chafing hard. And, yeah, and, and it's just, like, the whole time, like, he, Russell Crowe's being possessed, like, we see back in Rome, and there's, like, thunder and lightning flashing. It's like... Why is Russell Crowe's possession all the way over in Spain just like psychically affecting everybody back They're in spiritually yeah. tethered? He's just so goddamn important that everything is connected. He's the Pope's See, exorcist. I feel like the true he is. He is the Pope's the exorcist. downfall of saying it's based on a true story and you know the father of more stuff is the fact that they can't go far enough with it because like if they get if they 
force the Pope to be possessed and have the true, all you know, third act showdown be between Russell Crowe and a demonic and the pos- and pope. The dom- demonic pope. Like, yeah, they can't sign me the fuck up for that. I mean, I, I, I will say, yeah, I agree with you. I feel like it's it's a weird it's a weird place for them to draw the line because like this the the last like the climax of this movie gets like so over the top. Just there's like there's, I mean like. Russell Crowe, when he's possessed, he literally has like a staff and he like bangs it on the ground like, and well, it makes like a big fu- evil throne and, and makes like it. yeah like fire shoot uh, out dude, of like the grew. wall. Fire shoots out of the walls and then like 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 big cinder runes appear on the sides like fucking dark. Souls it's like and pentagrams shit. and like, shit. It yeah. rules. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's so like good. big burning pentagrams in this like like this video game like boss arena. Room. And it's like there's like, no it's, it's, it's there's no way shit. there's like, no way you can there's no way you can make me believe that any of this is based on anything that happened in reality so at that point why don't you just possess why, why, the why don't you yeah, yeah, why, don't exactly. you? why don't you but i will say at that point because of like all the, the crazy like silly cartoon bullshit that's happening because you would have had to ride his vespa all the way back to rome well, to fight the pope takes too much time you know, like but but I, I, I agree that the third act is great mm-hmm Imagine if that third act was in the middle of the movie. Was the whole movie? Even better. Yeah, it would be a better yeah, movie. Yeah, it it would have been a better film if they did that. Sure. 100%. Um, and I feel like they had the budget, too, also. like. But anyway, uh, what I will say, though, is like going back to my previous point about like The Conjuring, this is what like makes me like this movie way more than a Conjuring film. Like, it is, yes, it is based on a real person who is like maybe propagating some bullshit, uh, but in in, th- in this case, they take it so far, they make it so cartoony that honestly, it kind of feels like a statement going in the other direction. Like it feels like a statement saying that like this is this wasn't real. It's like like this, obviously, this this is demons bullshit, aren't real. Yeah. This is a cartoon, you silly bastard. And I love that. Like so, I sure. I'm I'm more inclined to be down with this. Movie yeah, over sure. Conjuring. No, I oh, I mean, yeah, it's better. Uh, it's yeah. better than yeah. it's better than the Conjuring. Yeah. I and mean, I just like, like feel oh, like perspective, but like I'm, you know, I don't want to get there. too moral about it one way or the other. I don't have a strong opinion on it, but I, I I do think that generally, like loosely morally, I I feel better about this kind of movie. Well, yeah, I mean, in in the moments where it does go the most over the top, like even if it's not necessarily good, it does at least do something to distinguish itself from every other based on a quote unquote it's, based on a true story exorcism movie. Like the yeah. conjuring is too like self but it, serious. But it really it really doesn't do it enough in my opinion. Like there's mm. huge swaths sure. of this movie where it's just like totally by the numbers generic exorcism movie. Like that that last like 10 15 minutes like is just so over the top it becomes completely nonsensical i'm like i don't know what the fuck is going on anymore like at some point the demon takes physical form as like this girl that he didn't save but i he but earlier in the movie only he can see her but then later she's actually there and then they throw her into the water and then they pray at it really hard and it becomes lava and suck <laughs> and like <laughs> sucks her back down into hell and it's just like at that at, like the the uh, the like the young priest's like ex girlfriend or whatever comes out of an iron maiden and is all bloody and I was just like I'm at a certain point I'm like I don't know what the fuck is going on here. I love that stupid it's, bullshit yeah so, it's, so. I, I, no it's like I don't know what the fuck is like I'll keep it's just like that fucking Trump tweet it's like I'll keep drinking <laughs> I'll keep drinking that shit you yeah know? like I don't know what the fuck is going on here but I'll keep I'll keep drinking that fucking bullshit it's so silly and so so over the top and like it's like I do wish more of the of movie like, was like yes, that exactly yeah I wish more sure, of the sure. movie was like that it would um, be it would be more fun but as climaxes go like it goes fucking wet and wild yeah and, sure. uh, yeah yeah I respect it um yeah, and, and much, much, much more than than I do. Like a lot of these other like big blockbuster movies. But what I will say too is like during all those sequences where the, the chick is like coming out of the casket and um, the, there's like magma and everything else coming through the floor. Like some of the magma effects look a little cheap, but like um, for the most part, like throughout this movie, even when it's boring, I do think it's quite well shot. I think that technically, in respect to production value, this movie is good. Like I think, yeah, I, mean, I think it's... It, I think it's quite well shot. I think it's it's quite well um, uh, choreographed. I think it's quite well edited. 
I think it's it's entertaining and fun to look at. And those are all things I was not expecting from this movie. Like I was I was not expecting it to look this good. I think uh, there's just certain sequences where they're in the dark cellars and they've got their flashlights out. Like the 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 tonal values are like fucking pres- like pristine. See, like it looked. I mean, to it me, looks, a lot of the it the, looks like a movie. It looks like the, movie should look. Yeah, I think, your, sta- I think the, your standards. A are lot low. of the heavy lifting of that is done by the location and production design. I think. Like, seeing the Pope open, like, this ancient tome. Yeah, sure. Or, like, these weird catacombs. Like, the locations are so cool that, yeah, like, sets. if, as long as it's lit competently, it's going to look really good. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it, it, it looks like a professionally made movie that had a budget, which it is, uh, and it did. Um, I, but, but like, there's there's uh, there's other professionally made movies with a big budget. That I think that look bad. A, gr- a great example is The Nun. Like, I think The Nun is a pretty has a pretty had a fairly comparable budget. I think this and m- looks and is shot and is edited way worse. I think no, I the, the Nun feels like a trailer. Like, I, it's it's really weird, like how it's edited. It's it's. I know. mean. In 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 how it's edited, I will agree with you. But in how it looks and the how it's shot and the production and set design, this movie is stylistically almost indistinguishable from the Nun. They are they are practically the same. Uh, the I, Nun. I, I would disagree. The I Nun think, is edited worse. I think but... the Nun is way more monochromatic yes. than this movie. I feel like this movie has to look at. flourishes of color. Where this, uh, the nun didn't. This movie, this movie has fire in the climax, where the I mean, where the nun the, does the, not. The, the bloody people, like the the bloody woman looking like fucking Carrie. Yeah, and you know the cross is put to her head, and she explodes. Does that explode? Yeah, she explodes. The Blood explosion, explosion part was good. Yeah, yeah. there's like a bit. Awesome. Where, yeah, like she comes, she comes out of like a giant iron maiden and like crawls up over me, puts a cross on her head, and she explodes. In well, a big she gets blood like explosion. polyps all, all over her body. Yeah, it's really well done. Like there's a there's a bit where the the boy like his his eyes like roll back. It's like this close up shot and like you see his pupils like move to the left and then like demon pupils like appear like out of like the the, the weird like embers and shit and it looks great. I thought that was pretty cool. It was cool. Yeah. That was a it cool was effect. Fun. Yeah, and it was. It was like it's really good CG. Like like in some of these sure. sequences, like the teams that they got to do them did a, technically a good job, and I and I think that's worth saying. Um, I think I think when she gets like pulled into the magma, it looks kind of. I think it's pretty. I think it, but, truthfully, I think it's pretty industry standard. What do you all think about the like, the wide mouths? We I thought that, that a I few thought times. it looked. I thought it looked terrible, like it does in every <laughs> other yeah, movie. That looked pretty silly. The, the part, uh, the part where Russell, funny. the part where Russell Crowe does the big mouth and scream, it looked like the Mummy, which came out I in nineteen ninety nine. I love Same. that shit. Same. Okay, so this, that's the thing, right? Like, like there, there are those shots, like I was talking about with the pupils and stuff, where I think it earnestly looks good. But in those sequences with their mouths pop open and stuff, it looks corny. It looks but it like looks, shit. It looks bad, but it looks. Funny. It looks like garbage, it's funny. and I love it. Yes. It's funny, yeah. Like I, I think we kind of get the best of both in this movie. Is is my argument? Like I think, yeah. Like there's there's those sequences where like I think technically it looks pretty good, and then there's other sequences where it looks bad, but it's funny, and I laugh at it, and I have a good time. Either one way or the other, I'm having a good time with this movie. Well, I think we should about wrap up, but yeah. we should talk about how uh, they try to set up for sequels maybe <laughs> in just like a way that again Let's like completely it. departs from reality where he gets back to the vatican and it's like oh that nasty american priest uh he saw christ's nipples bleeding and he had to go on a sabbatical in guam so uh now your friend priest uh, is in i pray for guam he's oh yeah i pray i pray for, I pray for guam i pray for guam um so now was, this, this other, is that like that coffee and cigarettes voice throughout this with the Italian accent. I play for Guam. Now play this so other uh, now this other priest who is his friend is in charge of exorcisms or whatever, and he takes him into like the the basement of the Vatican, and it's basically uh, whatever the the bureau is called in Hellboy. Hellboy, yeah, uh, yeah. There are things that go bump in the night that we bump it back. <laughs> So fucking great. They've got all these relics and stuff and, like, all these people on computers, but there's also, like, old tomes and stuff. So you've got the old meets the new. And they're like, there were 200 
angels who fell from grace and are imprisoned in hell you defeated you defeated this one but there's still 199 <laughs> out there so there's there's work that must be done that dun, is dun, too dun. much for one life there's two but yeah, maybe but two. two but maybe two so then he recruits the young priest buddy priest movie. buddy priest movie and then at the end is like and then uh father amorth died in 2016 <laughs> <laughs> and he and he wrote a bunch of books, and the books are good. And buy the books, and then no, I, and I, then I do, cut. I do think that shit is really fucking funny. It's him riding on his Vespa through Rome again, and it's like Father Amor, blah blah blah. Wrote wrote all these books, and he did all these things, and he died in 2016. The books are good. Like the last line of the movie, like that we we read <laughs> we read on screen. The big thing they really want to send us off into the credits and back out into the world with is. The books are good. Well, and then the first credit that pops up when it cuts to credits is based on these two books by Father Gabriel Amor. Fantastic. It's like, the books are good. Read the books. Based on the books. Buy the books. Like and subscribe. Ring the bell as well. Like, <laughs> it's like, does this, studi yeah. does this so studio, funny. does, like, Screen Gems own the rights to, like, Father Amor's, like, books or whatever? It's Dude, like, I just, it, buy the books. The, the thing that's funny about it to me Father is, not, is will how be much back. it cares. It's not how sincere it is it's how laissez-faire they are about it like like they literally yeah, like, say oh, what, the books are good like at the end of it like dude well, the books it's, are good man it's, it's like mere... it's so casual and i i think that's really funny it's 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 a callback to earlier in the movie when he first meets the young priest he's like oh i know who you are i've read like all the articles that you wrote in like exorcism monthly or whatever and he's like have did you read any of my books he's like well no i haven't read your books he's like you should read the books the books are the, the books, books are, are good, good. Yeah. and then it's like and then it has to end is like, oh, he died and he wrote a bunch of books and the books are good. But we don't we don't know yet if he defeated the other one hundred and ninety nine demons and banished maybe, them all maybe back. Maybe we to hell. Find better out the books. read the books to find better out. Better read the books to find out. I and you know might. and you know what? Might. And you know what? <laughs> it's it's twenty twenty three and we haven't uh, all been uh, sucked down to hell yet, so I don't know. My money is on he did. I mean, he did the it. jury's out on that. Yeah. I think honestly. I think we need at least six more films in this franchise. To yeah, find out. and I, I'm here for it. Let's go. I think we need to find a way to bring back Father Amorth so he can uh, he can exercise Dude, the rest of those demons. Let, let Russell Crowe just keep playing this character. <laughs> let him cook, man. Yeah, let let's, him fucking cook. Let's man. get a bunch. Let's get a it. bunch more of these. I don't give. I'll, I don't give a shit. Yeah, I'll, fuck it. I'll keep hurting. I'll keep drinking that garbage. Yeah, dude. Well, uh, why don't you give final impressions and throw a rating on that? Yeah. Um, I don't know, man. The movie kind of sucked, but like <laughs> Russell Crowe is great, uh, and it made me laugh a number of times. Like, I had three out of five, I guess. Yeah, the, you know. Once again, I said it before, and I'll say it again. It's hard to overcome the tropes of the subgenre of exorcism movies. I feel like bringing in the Overlord director certainly helps with flourishes of gore and over the topness. Um, and bringing in Russell Crowe also helps because he does a, such a great job, genuinely, with this movie. Mm -hmm. Where again, like. At times, he understands the assignment and camps it up, and at other times, he keeps it grounded. And I think he does a great job. Overall, it's not great, but it's fun. I'm going to give it a three and a half out of five. Uh, ditto that. I would say a strong 3.5 is, is a great place. Uh, that's a great spot for this movie to sit. I, I had a fun time watching with you guys. I I like uh I, I just I think Russell Crowe was delightful in this movie. Um I've always been a big Russell Crowe fan. Uh and uh I I was I've always been a big Russell Crowe fan, but I did go into this movie expecting like him to be doing a bad Italian accent. And I'm gonna be real, I thought it was really compelling and fun. And anytime he was on screen, I was having a great time. He's on screen plenty of this movie. Uh I wasn't expecting of the elaborate sets either, and I wasn't expecting um it to be so self-aware and to be and to lean in so hard to the dude's rock vibes of this like fun 80s exorcism film um it checks a lot of boxes so i think putting it like you know towards the middle is good but positively for sure so yeah 3.5 well, no doubt 
truly what we do in this life echoes in eternity. <laughs> uh, that'll give the Pope's exorcist an average of 3.3 out of 5. Only 0.1 uh, higher than our average for the Outwaters. <laughs> so <laughs> we, end, we ended up in about the same place. On yes. This. Well, delight Good, and delight. Wait. You guys did. Good job, good job, <laughs> gang. Yeah. yeah, I think I think Tees, I think uh, you nailed the assignment. One of these movies was certainly my despair, and one of these movies was my delight. I had a wonderful time. Yeah. So I think uh, I think you picked good, and I I'm I, glad I'm glad you got it. I uh, uh, I'm yeah. quite happy with what you picked. And I appreciated the theme. I've known you, I've known you for many years, That's so true. I I I feel I felt confident in uh, in in doing that. Well, that will wrap up our uh, 2023 mid year catch up. It's a long fucking episode, so we'll try to be brief for the rest of this. Next week is a Patreon pick. Uh, that pick comes courtesy of our honorary pod boy, Zach. Uh, Zach has chosen uh, a pretty exciting film for us to watch. We're going to be watching 2006's The Host, Bong oh, Joon-ho's kaiju hell film. Yeah. Oh, I've been um, meaning to watch that. Sick. Love that yeah, movie. It's great. Yeah, I've been meaning to check that. I have not seen it in, I've not seen it in many, many years. Uh, I'm looking forward to revisiting it. So that will be uh, next week's episode. So uh, come back and join us then. Yeah, let's do a sponsor real quick. Yeah, okay. Real quick. Keep it real, short. Real, real quick. All right. The shelf speaks to me, and it glows, and it says words, and all the other Lovecraftian shit that we've been building up over the past four years. All right, here we go. It says, this week is sponsored to you by Bobby Grundle, you know, from high school. We all had a Bobby Grundle in our lives, and that Bobby Grundle has come here today to let you know that he's bringing these sweet words from our lips straight to your ears. Thanks, Bobby Grundle Thanks, from, Bobby high school, Grundle from high, school. high school for sponsoring our mid-year catch-up. We, we sure do appreciate Bobby it. Grundle. And if you didn't, you did, but you just didn't realize it. He was there. Bobby Grundle was in all of them. Everybody has a Bobby Grundle from high school. Everybody Everybody's has a Bobby got a Bobby, Grundle from, high a Bobby Grundle from high school. Yeah. All right, that'll do it for us. If you like the show, leave us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts. Leave us a nice review. Tell your friend. Share an episode. Blah, blah, blah. All of it. You can support us on Patreon. Patreon.com slash podpeoplepod. Shout out to the honorary pod boys, Sam, Zach, and Micah. Y'all are the best. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter, podpeoplepod, letterbox.com, podpeoplepod. And that's where all the films we've talked about on the show with our average ratings and links to those reviews, they all live there on Letterboxd. I'm on Twitter at some spooky snake. Um, for recommendation corner, it's summer. Uh, go try disc golf. Uh, <laughs> awesome. It's uh, U Disc is a great app if you're trying to keep track of your scores and find local courses around you. Yeah, it's fun. It's a great activity. U Disc, we golf. Yeah, dude, yeah. Dude, dude, disc, yeah, big ditto that. Disc golf is great. I'm gonna ditto that even further. I'm not shouting out where I work this week. Fuck that. I, I, I keep doing that. Um, uh, instead, I'm going to shout out all of those other found footage movies that I mentioned earlier, <laughs> right? Like, we got, we got The Curse of Professor Zardonicus. We got Hell House LLC. We got Paranormal Farm. We got Bad Ben. We got, like, all these other, like, found footage movies that I would highly recommend checking out that are, that are kind of fun. And they're, if you're looking for, for more movies like that, like, that you can, you can go and see. I'm missing other great ones. Uh, Blackwall Ghost, I don't give a shit. Whatever. There's, there's plenty of fine found footage movies you can check out. And you should. It's a, it's a cool genre because it's mostly people with no budget just trying to get their start in the industry. And I think that's neat. That's it for me, baby. I got some thoughts on that. We're getting (laughs) off recording. But thank you for listening. Uh, Happy halfway through the year. All right, bye.